Tony Benn is one of the most respected political figures in Britain. In an era dominated by PR and spin, he's seen as principled and honest, even by those who oppose his political values. In 2007, he was voted Britain's political hero by the BBC Two Daily Politics programme, ahead of Margaret Thatcher, the SNP's Alex Salmond and Claire Short. The Benn Diaries cover 50 years at the heart of political life in Britain and have made Tony Benn one of the great diarists of the age. But it wasn't always this way. Tony Benn is one of the few figures in national politics who have become more left-wing as they've grown older. At the height of the left's power in the Labour Party, Benn was reviled by the press and bitterly attacked by the right wing. In this series of programmes, made with access to Tony Benn's unique film archive, he tells us about the events that have shaped his life and our times. He reflects on the dramatic political moments that he saw at first hand, often as a participant. There was a Tory government elected in uh, 1970, and it was eventually broken by mass industrial unrest, particularly by the miners' strikes of 1972 and 1974. Um, tell me what you remember is most important from that period. Well, I remember exactly as you say it. I thought we would win in 1970, but uh, Wilson fought a very poor campaign. He, he felt that he should travel around like the Queen and be seen in places, and. Uh, and Heath was very clever. He said he would cut prices at the stroke and, and, and so on, and it had a certain credibility. Uh, but uh, then uh, Heath made the great mistake of really pitching into a fight with the miners and then calling an election and saying, who governs Britain? And the people responded very clearly, not you, Mr. Mr. Heath. And so we won the election in 74. And then, uh, from then until 79, when Mrs. Thatcher came in, we were in opposition. We didn't really have much of a majority. It was a very, very difficult situation to be in. And uh, there was a lot of industrial action, quite understandably, given what was happening to people and their jobs. We want an answer. Don't keep leaving it waiting. We want the answer now. We're fed up with this on the door. We want our money. And all we want is a fair do. We're not asking you to give us a £20 or a £40 either to even go on down the other social contract. We want work. At that time, the Labour Party began uh, recreating a left people who had already realised what was going on and saw the right way to fight it was to reorganise the party, to campaign actively, uh, to uh, campaign in Parliament, outside Parliament, modernise the Labour Party and so on. And uh, it was during that period that we had, I think, the campaign for Labour Party democracy first uh, became very strong and it, it formed itself into a group that was later uh, in the 1980s became much stronger and focused and uh, you will remember what the arguments were but I mean during the miners strike we gave full support to the miners and uh, and undoubtedly that played a part in the defeat of Heath. Mm. Let, let me just um, uh, pause for a minute about, about the miners because um, the miners really weren't the militant union at that point that everybody remembers and they've virtually not been on strike since the 1926 general strike. Uh, the leader of the National Union Mine Workers at the time, Joe Cormley, was a right-wing figure, not a left-wing uh, figure. So the, the revolt by the miners must have been a huge shock to the political system both in the Labour Party and, and for the Tory government. Well, if you go right back to the beginning, when Keir Hardy heard the miners had affiliated to the Labour Party, he was despondent because he'd worked with the NUM, being a miner himself. And it is true, Gormley was very much a figure of the right, but there was a left in the trade union movement, and uh, it emerged very, very strongly. The thing about miners is the solidarity is inbuilt in the job. If you work underground, you have to rely 100% on the guy next to you. If there's a fire, if there's an explosion, if there's gas, you've got to rely on other people to support you. And that, uh, is a work-based solidarity that expresses itself when the strike takes place. Immense sacrifices made by miners to support one another during the strikes. And of course it also uh, made the Conservative Party hate the miners very much because having defeated Heath as they saw it, they were determined to take it out on the miners as Mrs Thatcher did uh, in 84-85.
Mm. Because Heath made a terrible gamble and it didn't work. I mean, he, he put the country on a three-day week. Um, there were power cuts, so the lights were, go, were, were going out. It, um, it created a sense of social crisis, but in the end, people blamed the Tory government and not the miners. Yes, I think that's broadly true. And it created, for a period, a sort of water and military solidarity. And the enemy was the Prime Minister and not the NUM. First, that the trade union movement, after a century of external influence upon successive governments, including 40 years of consensus politics in which it became an active participant at the highest level of decision-making, has now seen that consensus transformed first into a form of corporatism, which was not in the interests of labor, and then be rejected because a declining British capitalism can no longer afford to maintain full employment and the welfare state. During that uh, same period, after the Tories were returned in, in 1970, um, you called for a, a referendum on the European Economic Community, as the um, EU was, was called then. The 21 years after I urged the referendum, I should have won the Right Honourable Lady, the Member for Finchley, and the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Yeovil, to my cause. If you have to wait 21 years, it's worth waiting for some recognition that the people have a right in their government. The European question is a very dominant question, really. And uh, looking back on it, I see it in this way. We had two world wars in Europe, and uh, so there were a lot of people, and Ted Heath was one of the most prominent who uh, said, well, uh, we can't ever do that again, we must work together. And I agreed with that, and on one occasion I thought this was perhaps the way in which you could build up sufficient democratic pressure to control the multinational corporations. But uh, uh, we had the uh, referendum in 75, and we lost, uh, I lost, the view that I took was defeated. And uh, I then immediately went on to the Council of Ministers, for Energy Ministers, and I was on it for four years. And what I saw from the inside of Europe really frightened the life out of me because there's absolutely no democracy in Europe. It's uh, run by commissioners who are appointed, not elected. They're not accountable for what they do to anybody. And uh, so uh, my view became more strongly of the opinion that we couldn't go along with it as it is. But I don't uh, do it on the grounds of nationalism but democracy. Is my dear constituents, in future you will be governed by people you do not elect and cannot rule. I'm sorry about it, they may give you better creches, they might give you shorter working hours, but you can't remove them. And of course, in a way, not only have our rights been taken away, but so the German rights and the Italian and the French have all lost their rights. And um, what we have is a, a corporate structure run by administrators, and it is going to try to snuff out our domestic democracy. And it won't be much use in protecting us from market forces. Mm. Well, of course, um, since that time, um, the anti-European argument has been identified with the with the right, with a nationalistic argument. So, um, uh, people may be less familiar today than they were at the time with the fact that there was also a left-wing argument uh, against the yes. European Community, and that was based on lack of democracy, not on nationalism. Absolutely right. And uh, we got uh, turned, identified as being uh, foreign haters and all that. Uh, but uh, it, in a funny way, when you talk about democracy, you do unite forces from right across the spectrum. Uh, and it's a bit puzzling to explain it, but uh, people like David Davis, for example, who resigned over the 42 days detention, the control orders, uh, he felt this was a democratic issue, and so did I, and I went to speak for him. And, uh, and so it's a bit of a mixture. It doesn't fit in. Uh, in quite the way you'd expect politics would work.